Hello, hello everyone. Um, welcome to this installment of the Transformation Literacy Conference Series. My name is Lule Kwakaiba and I am joining you from Cape Town, South Africa. So now that you have had where I'm joining you from, I am also inviting you via the chat function to tell us your name and also the city and the country that you are joining this session from. And a little bit about CLI, our organization. Um, I would say that we are an internationally operating organization that works um, together with teams, with uh, ministries, with uh, internationally run networks, looking at how we can sustainably um, implement the SDGs. Coming to the SDGs, when we look at SDG number 17, that is why we wake up as an organization every day. And this is why we are in existence. So we are really passionate about uh, transformation literacy, but also transformative outcomes that hopefully well, one day will have CLI out of business, where there is no longer a need for CLI. Um, today's topic will also be focusing on governance. It is um, a topic that I am emotionally connected to, but also it is a pleasure to talk about governance, not only as a staff member at CLI, but also as a South African, an African, and also um, a citizen of the world. And today we want to look specifically from practical examples um, on lessons that we can perhaps integrate into how we work. And these lessons we will be hearing from various speakers um, where we will be looking uh, to uh, the migration governance and policy development in Ghana. And that conversation, we will be having it with my brother, Dr. Leander Kandenige, and then we will fly to Europe and there we have uh, the remarkable Barbara L. Benzmaya. Apologies for how I am pronouncing your last name. And with her, we want to look at the role that is played by civil society organizations in various formats, whether these are movements or forums, and also learn there the impact that they have on governance we fly back to Africa, and then we look closer to my home within the Southern Africa region. We will then fly over to Lusaka, where we will hear about the initiative called Lusaka Water Security Initiative, and also how the formation and the existence of uh, this initiative has impacted water security governance not only in Lusaka, but also the lessons that it has brought for the country of Zambia. And then again, we are back to Morocco um, with Mr. Ahmed, Mr. Ahmed Muyayihawu. And again, please accept my apologies in how I am pronouncing the last name. Um, what we are going to be looking at with Ahmed is also one of our key challenges in the continent, Africa. Here we will be talking about uh, providing these platforms that look at uh, the economic development and entrepreneurial support, especially for young people. So as I've said earlier, um, our focus today is looking at governance looking at how we can learn collectively while also navigating our differences. Because if there's one thing that we also know about collaboration or multi-stakeholder collaboration is that usually we come as um, these individuals or these organizations that are coming with competing mandates, usually there are clashes there. So we will also be hearing from those practical examples. 
and let's see before i run over this part i am not alone today on this session i am uh with my boss maybe she will not want me to say that so we also have dot <laughs> Okay, then I will say I am with my Magazi. So I am with uh, Magazi, Dr. Petra Kunkel, who is uh, the founder and the director of CLI Global. She will also be telling us why transformation literacy is important and why we are having um, this series of uh, sessions and especially why it is important even when we are where we are um in the world why it is important for us to have these conversations and really connect and learn uh, from each other with that i would like to hand over to petra thanks Ludigma. thanks so much and welcome everybody to our transformation literacy conference to our session on governance today and yes indeed um Ludigma hasn't mentioned one thing and the most important thing uh, that she hasn't mentioned is that the Collective Leadership uh, Institute in its foundation has been so much inspired from the South African transition process. And um, I personally have learned a lot from that. So uh, today we are concentrating on governance, but I would like to say a little bit more about transformation literacy more in general. Uh, those of you who have attended other sessions or those of you who had a look at the, the website and the, the briefing uh, have understood that uh, around the collective leadership compass we have developed what we call the transformation enablers that are so extremely important and they are based on a lot of uh, tested reality uh, how to bring about transformative change if it's about large scale issues. But the interesting thing is that large scale issues, you know, like be it climate change or be it biodiversity loss or be it be it um, no plastic or be it anything that is so absolutely important in the world is always linked to what we consider smaller issues like how do I engage stakeholders and um, who do I actually need to bring into a dialogue and what are the different actors in a society that are important for a certain issue. And, and those of, of you who are attending the program today and, and, and the panelists know that each and every little step to get things going around uh, transformative change uh, means that I really need to deal with different actors. I need to deal with different people. I need to bring them all on board. And uh, most importantly, and that is the issue about today, it is about how can different stakeholders learn together and how can they learn collectively and there are very various ways of doing that there are consultation processes that are extremely important and those of you who are operating in in governance in governments or operating even in companies know that consultation processes are extremely important and then there are uh, let, let's say initiatives around consultative processes that are more initiated by civil society and here it is about really creating networks of act actors and most often these networks start as you know we have an example today as platforms where people come together and can can really say now now we found a place where we can talk with each other in a different way and where we can learn with each other in a different way and most importantly where we strengthen each other in a different way so this is another way so if we talk about governance we not only talk about fixed governance structures like a, a democratic society would have governance structures or um, a, a good company would have governance structures. We talk about these structures, but we need to be aware that these structures could be networks, these could be platforms, these could be uh, serial consultative dialogues, these could be partnerships, this could be initiatives, etc. And what is so extremely important, if we look at the big issues in the world, and uh, Lulikwa has mentioned the, the sustainable development goals and the goal number number 17, when, when we look at the, the situation at the moment, it's everybody's job to go about transformation. That no community is too small to not take part in an energy change and uh, no city is too big 
to actually get together uh, with different stakeholders. And at the same time, we also need to think about um, how to connect cross country. So with that spectrum that we have today, I think it's going to be really, really exciting to look at governance issues. And with that short introduction, I would like to hand back to Lalikwa. Thank you so much, Petra. And now we go to our first speaker. Um, I'm inviting everyone to welcome Dr. Leander Kandulike. So um, where do I start? We do not have the time. So our um, series organizers have really allowed me to say a little bit um, and I will try. So the rest you can see from his bio. So the reason why we are having this conversation with Dr. Leander Kandelega, because he is someone who really has expertise in this field. Um, he's not only a senior lecturer of migration studies at the University of Ghana, but he is also a researcher that is affiliated to various institutions, um, including the University of Oxford, he also becomes a visiting lecturer, for example, the University of um, Northampton, but also he wears other hats. He is also an advisor. He hasn't been only an advisor to us um, as individuals, but also he gets involved also with governments when there is um, important policy process that is taking place, especially in migration governance and policy development. So these are just some of the heads that he wears. And this is why we have invited him to come um, here and have this conversation with us. So Dr. Leander, there is so much that can be said on migration, um, especially for us, I guess, as Africans, looking where we are at. Um, in your vast experience and all of the big organizations that you have worked with, including the International Organization on Migration, what um, would you say are the lessons that we really need to pay attention to when it comes to um, migration governance and policy development? Over to you. Right, okay, so thank you very much, uh, Luleka, uh, for the introduction. I'm really flattered to, to have been invited by yourself and then uh, my brother Douglas um, to share a few reflections. So I say good afternoon, good evening to everyone, wherever you are joining us from. Um, I'm happy to give a few reflections on the specific topic of uh, lessons from migration governance and policy development. So I wish to start here by paying tribute actually to uh, CLI for this excellent uh, training program that they have developed over the years on collective learning and then uh, uh, working collaboratively towards achieving a shared purpose. And I don't pretend to be an expert in uh, collective learning, especially not in the presence of Petra, who is the executive uh, committee member of the Club of Rome and also the founder of uh, CLI. Uh, as we know, uh, Petra is a systems uh, psychologist and a visionary uh, author and an expert in complex uh, multi-stakeholder collaborations. So I defer totally to uh, Petra to fill in the blanks. She's already given us uh, a teaser there. Um, instead, I want to focus my short presentation on uh, just sharing a few reflections on migration broadly, international migration, by also looking at uh, attempts at migration governance migration policy development, especially within the African context, and then to touch also on issues of uh, multi-stakeholder uh, dialogues in, in Ghana. So um, I will start uh, off by saying that uh, it's usually very difficult to provide any recommendations on that which is not clearly defined. So I'm going to take us a step back and being a, a typical uh, academic, I want to define migration broadly. Uh, as the movement across space between one geographical unit and another, involving a permanent or semi-permanent uh, change of residence. I know the UN prefers a qualifying period of 12 months, but IOM says uh, six months is sufficient. And we know 
that there are different uh, typologies of migration, including internal, international, regular, irregular, rural, urban, and so on and so forth. And uh, But then one will be forgiven for thinking that international migration is uh, the predominant form of uh, migration based on the re uh, media reportage uh, on so-called migration crises, uh, waves of migrants, flooding of destination countries by African migrants, and so on and so forth. But then what I can say is all these uh, aquatic met metaphors that I use are usually meant to engender a sense of inundation or an overwhelming of uh, destination uh, countries. So much as international migration, as noted by other scholars like Stephen Castle and then uh, Miller, in their seminal work, uh, specifically the age of migration, it has accelerated, is globalized, feminized, diversified, and become increasingly uh, politicized. But empirical evidence uh, confirms the fact that international migration has never represented more than 4% of the global population since 1965. So for instance, in 2020, the number was uh, 281 million uh, people who were considered as international migrants. But this seemingly massive uh, figure only represented 3.6% of the global population. So this is what uh, some scholars like Gunnar Malmek will refer to as this immobility paradox or uh, involuntary immobility. So this minority form of migration, nonetheless, yields substantial amounts of uh, cash and then social remittances for origin countries, cheap labor for destination countries. And the volumes are quite huge. You are looking at 702 billion uh, dollars globally in 2020. And this is uh, a reduction from 717 in 2019 because of the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And the bulk of this money is going to developing countries. And that's what makes it very interesting. So 540 billion, uh, that's 72% of the money in 2020 went to uh, low and middle income countries. So this significant amounts that accrue to migration have it has partly prompted a renewed effort to seek to govern migration in a way that allows origin countries uh, to harness the potential benefits of uh, migration towards national socioeconomic development, but to be done in a way that is safe, orderly, and then regular. So, and also to dissuade people from embarking on irregular arrivals at uh, destination countries. And we know that empirical research also shows that migration can contribute to, and it can uh, at the same time have important uh, impact on shaping more sustainable and then uh, just economies in countries of origin, transit, destination, and return. And but then the contributions of migration, we should remember, are not only measurable in terms of monetary terms, but then they also encompass knowledge, support, networks, values, skills that migrants transfer between societies. So as students, workers, entrepreneurs, consumers, savers, taxpayers, family members, migrants have contributed considerably towards sustainable development processes in sociocultural, civic, political, and then economic domains. So ordinarily, now to come to the word governance, before we look at migration governance, and then we'll situate it within the Ghanaian context, uh, the word governance is usually a contested term, but it is one of the key concepts that is um, employed to explain policy making processes and then understand it. Understanding this is paramount. So, usually, if it's used loosely, it refers to uh, the broader relations between rulers and then subjects. But in this regard, we want to define it as uh, the structure that patterns the relations between various political uh, actors. And you can also describe it as uh, the direct influence of societal processes. However, because Power is entangled, you know, the entangled nature of power. Um, governance is not only hierarchical, but it can also be persuasive. And this brings out both decision makers and their recipients into a situation of cooperation. Now, to define uh, migration governance specifically, IOM defines migration governance as the combined frameworks of legal norms, laws, regulations, policies, traditions, as well as organizational structures. And we are looking at it at different spatial levels, subnational, national, regional, international, and the relevant policies that shape and regulate state approaches with regard to migration in all its forms, and that seek to address rights 
and responsibilities and to promote international cooperation. I will, I will skip a few more of these and I just say that we have a lot of examples. There's a plethora of examples of approaches, initiatives, and then tools that have been used to govern migration at different spatial levels. And recent examples include what was just uh, alluded to by yourself and then Petra, the GCM, the Global Compact for Migration, but also the Global Compact on Refugees. You know, at the African level, we also have some uh, rather prominent examples of uh, attempts at migration governance. If we start at the AU level, we can talk of the uh, migration policy framework for Africa. We can also point to the AU Free Movement Protocol uh, 2018. And then even the, e, the AU or the African Economic Community, that's AEC, and then the eight regional economic communities. These arrangements also seek to govern migration to some extent. And when I talk of the eight uh, regional groupings, I'm referring to ECOWAS, that's Economic Community of West African States, but also the Common Market for Eastern and uh, Southern Africa, COMESA. You can talk of uh, Economic Community of Central African States, ECAS, then the Southern African Development Community, SADC, Intergovernmental Authority on Development, which is uh, IGAD, then the Arab Maghreb Union, UMA, then the community of Sahel, Saharan states, that sends that, and then finally the East African community. These are all institutions that have been set up or attempts at governing uh, migration. Now, related to migration governance is the issue of migration policy. So this, uh, within the context of the migration governance framework that was developed by IOM is defined as laws law and then uh, the policy that affects the movement of people. And this usually includes things like travel, temporary uh, mobility, immigration, emigration, nationality, labor markets, economic and social development, industry, commerce, social cohesion, social services, health, education, law enforcement, foreign policy, trade, and humanitarian issues. Now, such a definition brings out all the, the various themes or topics that are needed to be, or that need to be covered in a country's migration governance uh, structure. So as part of the international migration architecture at the uh, level of African states, uh, just as in the case of others, we, there has been this encouragement or support by international organizations like IOM, ICMPD, the EU, ECOWAS, among others, to draft national migration policies as a means of governing migration, both internally and uh, internationally. So I will turn my attention specifically now to the Ghanaian context to try and then tease out some examples for our con conversation. So as a country, Ghana has uh, transitioned from being mainly an immigration country prior to 1965 to becoming an immigration country due to socioeconomic and then political changes from 1965 to 1992 when the country returned to democratic uh, governance. And then the economy has uh, gained a lot in terms of uh, making significant progress. And with time, a lot of people have been able to afford the cost of long distance migration, international migration to Europe, North America, and then the Gulf states. So Ghana has become a destination of choice for predominantly West African uh, migrants over time. So it has made the country both an immigration country but also an emigration country. But for a very long period of time, the country has been governed by an eclectic mix of policies that have sought to manage aspects of uh, the broader migration spectrum. Now, they, they are quite a number, so I don't wish to uh, itemize them. But then the use of different policies, acts, and then legislative instruments did not support this coherent governance of migration. And inadvertently, it led to ad hoc and disjointed reactions to migration-related issues. So I want to reflect on three, the three main policies, migration-related policies in Ghana, just to contextualize the discussion. So in the year 2016, Ghana eventually launched the National Migration Policy for the country. And this was meant to serve as a tool for comprehensive and coherent governance of migration in the country. So the policy development process is what I want to uh, highlight, and then we will see if there are lessons learned from that. So this was 
uh, a collaborative effort that involved extensive consultations with a varied group of stakeholders, both state and non-state actors. And this included the government ministries, departments, and agencies, but also decentralized agencies, diaspora associations, civil society organizations, including migrant groups, traditional authority, private sector representatives, academia, development partners, and then the general public. Now, an inter interministerial steering committee was set up on migration, and this was supposed to spearhead the actual drafting process of the policy. And this included representatives from different government ministries uh, across uh, the, the wide spectrum. Now, the broad consultation with a variety of stakeholders has ensured that this policy has a lot of support and it has very high awareness levels among the Ghanaian uh, population. The second policy that I want to highlight is one that was launched in 2020, which is very different from that of the national migration policy. This is the national labor migration policy, which was specifically to govern the labor migration uh, into, from, and then uh, in the country itself. Now, the drafters said that to ensure policy coherence and their ownership, the policy development process adapted what they themselves claim to have been a systematic, collaborative, and then consultative uh, process. However, all that happened at this stage was a consultant was hired to work with an interministerial technical working group. The consultant did a, a situational analysis, and then that situational analysis focused on the socioeconomic context of labor migration in the country and an identification of the relevant opportunities and issues to be addressed by the policy. The rest of the work, the actual policy drafting, was done through a series of meetings with the technical working group, and then the policy was drafted. Now, the weakness in this drafting process, or this style of drafting, is the fact that there were no broad consultations with uh, stakeholders beyond the interministerial technical working group, and then the consultant and a few development partners like IOM that supported the process. Now, while this approach to policy development is quick and then relatively cheaper than the approaches that adopt real collaborative methods, this approach detracts from the sense of ownership that is usually associated with the whole of society approaches that uh, you expect in policy uh, development. Now, the very final uh, policy that I want to talk of is the diaspora engagement policy for Ghana. Now, the development of the diaspora engagement policy involved a systematic collaborative process, both within and outside Ghana to achieve policy credibility and then ownership. So first of all, a comprehensive situational analysis was done on the Ghanaian diaspora. Then among other things, this analysis sought, to, uh, sought reliable information on the areas that were considered as opportunities and challenges to inform the content of the main policy. Furthermore, consider, uh, considering that the diaspora engagement policy was supposed to address the interests of both Ghanaian, uh, the Ghanaian population within and outside the country, as well as uh, the people who have an interest in Ghana's socioeconomic progress, the views of relevant stakeholders in Ghana and then Ghanaian immigrants in selected uh, destination countries were also solicited. And then the process here entailed various stakeholder meetings, consultations, and then workshops. More specifically, the diaspora stakeholder meetings and then the listening consultative meetings, as we refer to them, they were held in Nigeria, they were held in Canada, the UK, and then Germany. And with these meetings, we were able to gather the views of Ghanaian nationals in the selected destination countries on what they considered as areas of interest that they would like the policy to address. In addition to these meetings, however, many Ghanaian missions and then consulates abroad also collated useful feedback or views from Ghanaians in their respective countries, and that was fed back to the drafting team. Then we, the listening, uh, meetings, the consultative meetings, we also had them in the country itself to solicit the views of relevant individuals and their organizations within the country. And to achieve that, we divided the country into three main zones. 
the we had the Accra zone, Sunyani zone, and then Tamale zone, representing the southern, middle, and then the northern geographical zones of the country. And we went a step further to also uh, consult the African diaspora community in Ghana, and then also the Universal Pan-African Coalition in Ghana. We topped it all off with an online survey, which was funded by the EU, and that also asked for and solicited additional views from the diaspora. Now, this is a very elaborate uh, process. And of course, this deliberate and detailed consultative approach will yield a policy document that is reflective of the views, the priorities, the aspirations, and also the fears of the generality of the targeted population. However, we should bear in mind that this approach is time consuming, is expensive, and it requires excellent negotiation skills on the part of the drafters of the policy to be able to incorporate the divergent views of different uh, segments of the stakeholders. So I wish to conclude here by just making a few uh, recommendations. I hear you, I heard the first question, and uh, the recommendations here will be that one, it highlights the need for us to have a thorough situational analysis prior to the drafting of any migration policy. Secondly, we also need issues of a, a comprehensive stakeholder mapping. And it's not just mapping by listing the names, but we also need to know their priorities. Okay, so an assessment and an appreciation for individual and then group priorities is an essential recommendation. And then to also create safe spaces where stakeholders can brainstorm freely and then adapt a reflexive kind of approach whereby the views are cross-checked with the stakeholders during the drafting process. And I recommend, of course, a participatory approach through multi-stakeholder dialogues to foster collective intelligence and then also to maintain that continuous feedback loop throughout the policy development and implementation uh, phases. So these are just uh, some ideas that, that come to mind readily, and I'll, I'll go into greater depth as uh, we, we proceed. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. And of course, I cannot let you go um, without asking you the following questions. First yeah. of all, I am happy that um, you gave us sort of like a general overview of what the continent does or the institutions that are there to actually look at um, migration governance for the continent as a whole. So yeah. one question will be coming from there. And also the second question will be coming from specifically, um, you know, to the Ghana example. And it's the same question for both. Now, when we look at our continent, um, it also, I am ashamed, first of all, as a South African, because I look at also how xenophobic we can be as a country and not really, as you said, look at what are the actual benefits of migration. And mm. perhaps maybe we forget quickly that before 1994, the continent was also a home, um, you know, to our uncles and our fathers who were in exile. So my question for you, Leander, there is, um, you have listed these institutions and they really sound good on paper, but in your view and the work that you do with your students, would you say that we have adequate structures that exist for the AU to sit in Ethiopia and say, yes, this is how we are going to take um, Africa, our continent to the next level, or this is how we are going to be working in collaboration, for example, with ILO, if that is the case, or with IOM, you know, if that is the case. And these, this is how our work is actually connected to their principles. So do we have enough structures there? And if we do not have, so what do we need to do? And then we go to Ghana. It's the same question there as well. You have given us an example of three policies and you have mentioned one in particular where the lesson also um, was that perhaps there wasn't really a, a broad uh, consultation process that is representative of 
the stakeholder system. So that is um, the biggest lesson there. So would you also say that um, in Ghana, we have at least put in place um, enough structures if there is such or adequate structures to really help us to start doing the work when we are looking at uh, migration governance and policy development? Yeah, so thank you very much for those uh, excellent questions. Um, migration governance is an important uh, component in trying to harness the benefits that accrue to migration broadly. However, when it comes to the governance, I think we need to domesticate what we do. Um, there is a lot of uh, externalization of migration control or governance from elsewhere. And my personal thinking is uh, we are almost uh, kind of uh, subcontracted to do the work of others instead of focusing on what, it is, what is relevant to the uh, African context. So most of our policies have this bias of discouraging irregular migration on behalf of someone else. And to put it bluntly on behalf of Europe, because that's where most of the funding comes from. And of course, if someone is funding a particular research or a policy document, that funding will dictate the terms of reference and then the focus of the policy. So what I would recommend here is uh, the need for local content and the fact that the, the policy has to be based on firm situational analysis. So we know where we are now, what is it that we need to do to progress as a country? And what does that policy mean for our local context? And how do we operationalize it within our system? The second issue has to do with our lack of desire to, to fund our own policies. So we've almost become addicted to funding from uh, Europe and elsewhere. And the expectation is unless the money is coming from somewhere, nothing gets done. And even when the money is provided for a particular activity to take place, as soon as the funding dries up, that is the end of that particular initiative. And it's a serious issue that we need to, uh, to take into consideration as a continent, and then to vote resources locally towards migration governance activities. And to take that ownership and make sure that it is reflective of the priorities of the people of the different countries rather than an externalized migration governance system on behalf of Europe and elsewhere. As a country, we have our unique challenges, but we also have our unique strengths. So Ghana has beautiful policies. No country drafts better policies than Ghana. The issue is the implementation. So we are very good at fine language, fine policies, but then we put them on the shelves and nothing gets done. So I think one key recommendation by our, uh, as part of our national migration policy was the establishment of a commission, a migration commission, which will coordinate the activities, all activities on migration in the country. Because now we have disparate uh institutions and government ministries agencies and departments do it pulling in different directions so we need a coherent migration governance system which will be anchored in the commission the ghana migration commission which was proposed so i will say yes we have the capacity so it's not about anyone coming from europe or elsewhere to build capacity you might say you are enhancing capacity or you are coordinating the existing capacity. There's, we don't have a problem of lack of capacity. I, at least I can speak for the Ghanaian context. We have competent people. We have competent institutions. It's just the desire to do the right thing, which always lets us down. So the commitment is what will make sure that the existing structures are more meaningful than they are at the moment. And we also need to make sure that policies are not generic in, in nature. They need to be reflective of the different components of society. So issues that pertain to the youth, for instance, are totally different from the priorities of uh, adults. So we deliberately contacted and then make sure that there was a section of the diaspora engagement policy that is dedicated to youth diaspora. Because we are not assuming that adult diaspora and the youth diaspora have exactly the same desires and then aspirations. So I think that's another area that we need to look at, gender issues, issues of uh, the youth in particular, and the fact that most of our population finds itself in the informal sector, 
So the sectoral focus of the policy is also critical. You cannot make a policy that is tailored or skewed in favor of only people who function in the formal sector, when over 80% of your population actually works in the informal sector. So we have that as a challenge for the country, but also at the regional level, ECOWAS, EAC, EGAD, they are all grappling with exactly the same situation. Their policies have prioritized the formal sector when their populations are actually in the informal sector. So there's that incoherence, policy incoherence, when it comes to the targeting of the focus of the, the policies. And that's another area that I think we need to uh, focus on. And to, to get the interest of the youth, we need to use digital means of communicating with the youth. They are not interested in long seminars and then conferences, but there are ways and means of drawing their attention and capturing the interests of the youth in participating in the policy drafting process. They cannot just be beneficiaries. We can't be talking about the youth as though they don't exist and assume that we are making policies on their behalf. Yeah, there's nothing to show that age is of relevance when it comes to intelligence and then uh, expertise. There are youth who do fantastic things and they better represent themselves rather than adults making policies on behalf of the youth. Oh my goodness. Um, yes, I, I still have a lot to ask you, but I will make this proposal, Dr. Leanda, because okay. we need now to bring in Barbara, you know, to sort of like, you know, take from where we are leaving things off. So there's okay. one request that I have for you, Dr. Leanda. You have a question on the chat. It is coming from, um, let's see, it is coming from Ben. Yes, from Ben Roberts. He has a beautiful question there. Could I then invite you to respond to the question via the chat function so that we then have Barbara as well picking up? And um, I do like also the other themes that you are bringing in into this governance uh, conversation where we look at how do we meaningfully bring in young people? How do we meaningfully bring in women or those who identify as women because they also do have um, a role to play in this uh, conversation. Thank you so much for your time. And again, uh, Ben Roberts is waiting for your answer in the chat. Uh, Petra, I am now handing over to you and Barbara. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Leander. Thank you, Lulekwa. And welcome, Barbara. Hello. Welcome. Now, this is a jump, Barbara. So we are going to fly back to Europe now. <laughs> but it was quite fascinating. And there are quite interesting points, you know, where to pick up. Um, so Liana was talking about particularly governance around policy development, giving beautiful examples of uh, what actually the difference is that it makes if you involve, if you go to the length of involving uh, the different stakeholders, the different actors, and bringing them together in a in a dialogue, and that the sense of ownership is just much much higher, but also mm -hmm. probably the quality of the outcome. So now we're jumping to the EU Russia Civil Society Forum, <laughs> which is not a government led institution. It's rather the opposite. It's a mm -hmm. civil society organization. It is a a network. It is a, a platform, and you're going to say more about it. But what I find fascinating is that it is the other way around of creating a body that where, where civil society organizations can support each other so that they're not alone so it's the coming together and making more of something you know so that you're not alone uh, it exactly. is cross-border it is cross let's say um, I almost want to say types of um, politics yeah so uh, you know kind of supporting civil society on areas you know have a, a hard time and um you in particular uh, barbara you have uh, a background uh, that makes you kind of ideal for such kind of project management um, around the civil society uh, forum because you are you studied in russia so you know the russian culture very well and i'm sure that you speak fluent russian if i guess yes. right yes so, i do <laughs> and um so it's in it's quite interesting so you have a lot of living lived experiences also in the country and so that makes it quite ideal for you um, as you also have a german background and you have a very kind of strong european background but it 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 helps you to cross the borders and cross the cultures and understand the different uh, different perspectives so uh, 
tell us a little bit more about um, you and particularly also about, you know, what exactly is the civil society, the EU Russia Civil Society Forum? Thank you. First of all, thank you, Petra, and uh, thank you also uh, to all the colleagues and also to Leander, uh, to this, uh, yeah, your first uh, input speech and words, which were, yeah, a little bit of a different topic for me, but as we said already, a couple of topics and also points that I would like to relate to. But yeah, just a couple of words about the EU Russia Civil Society Forum. Um, we are an NGO actually by NGOs. So uh, we are um, an organization um, aiming to um, enhance and um, build up better cooperation uh, between other civil society organizations in Russia. And by Russia, we mean the whole of Russia. And we're also very much focusing on the regions. I will talk about that maybe a little bit later. And also in, I think today, 15 EU countries. So not all EU countries, but almost all EU countries. And we were founded 10 years ago, 11 years ago already. We had our 10th anniversary last year uh, by civil society organizations. So it wasn't an initiative as many people always think, ah, EU Russia, so you were founded by the EU or you were actually founded by some governmental bodies. No, it was the other way around. Uh, there were um, activists, um, human rights defenders, other um, initiators of different NGOs in the beginning from Russia, from Germany, uh, Czech Republic, Poland, Hungary, uh, France, um, and they founded this, this platform. And uh, now it is a known organization. Our secretariat is based in Berlin, but we work with, yeah, as I said already, organizations from the Far East, Vladivostok to Greece, uh, Spain, uh, Italy, um, Ireland. Uh, so the whole Eurasian uh, continent um, is um, yeah, represented and active in our forum. In the can, I, can I quickly ask you how yes. many civil society organizations in Russia are actually part of the civil society forum? We Russia. have, yes, roughly, uh, as you can imagine, um, this um, what is a civil, civil society organization has changed a little bit in Russia over the last years um, because the different new laws and repression on NGOs have uh, led to initiatives not being registered anymore as NGOs or as registered associations as we know from the European Union. So actually in Russia, we also, we have collectives or we have different groups that form a civil society initiative, but are not maybe classical NGOs as we would see. And secondly, um, some have also of course left because of security reasons, because of other, um, other status. Um, so actually out of our 185 members, around half are from Russia. Um, so a bit, bit more than 90. Um, and we also, but we have new members coming from the EU and Russia more or less on a, on a parity base. So uh, it is, of course, a very uh, important instrument um, in countries like Russia, where civil society is underrepresented and repressed. But it's also an, yeah, uh, a vivid and important tool for, for other NGOs. May I just be asking you a very provocative question that is on my mind, but that may be also on the mind of quite a number of people. Uh, you know, many people uh, think about the situation at the moment, you know, with the, with the war in the Ukraine and um, the situation in Russia and, uh, you know, kind of get to know more and more uh, that the repression, repression actually um, is on the increase and an agent, you know, in the, in the last couple of years. So, so it, it's, it's increasingly difficult and, and yet at the same time, uh, people hope that civil society can really make a difference in Russia and can have a voice in Russia. So how do you see that recent development or the concrete situation at the moment? Um, can you let us know, you know, how, how is the situation of civil uh, society in Russia at the moment from those you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, thank you for that question. We at CSF are, of course, in touch with our members and not only our member organizations, with other partners, friends, colleagues all over Russia. And um, 
we were uh, of course also um, seeing and also expressing ourselves uh, our biggest solidarity with our colleagues uh, in Ukraine. Um, I need to make a small remark when we have also, we are EU Russia Civil Society Forum, but we do also work with Belarus, with Ukraine, uh, with Moldova and with other um, Eastern partnership countries or countries that are not part of the EU. This is a smaller part of our work, but it's also present. Um, and um, we see different tendencies right now, also within our members. Of course, our day-to-day -day work in the last weeks, also since uh, the new law of censorship was announced in Russia on the 4th of March, uh, was very much dealing with evacuating people, uh, evacuating journalists, media uh, representatives, um, other activists, uh, human rights defenders to so-called third countries, um, Armenia, Georgia, Turkey, um, other countries, or helping to somehow get visa to the European Union, to Germany. So there are um, members um, that see right now has come the point we have done everything we could, but it's too uh, dangerous to stay in Russia. And we uh, are still working with Russia. We are still working on a changing Russia into the democratic structure we, 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 we see there, but from exile, uh, from other countries. And um, we have other organizations that have also publicly decided to stay within the country um, and also have um, posted that and um, see that their role is there. Uh, the role is also on changing uh, the society from within the country. And um, yeah, um, these are also very experienced and very long, especially human rights defenders or other, uh, other organizations in different regions. Um, yeah, but it very much also depends on, on the topical work also on the regions, um, we have seen also slightly different perspectives from uh, members working in Siberia or in the Far East or from those working in Kaliningrad or St. Petersburg, where there was always a closer connection to Europe, to the European Union and also to all um, tendencies and changes that were going on there. So yeah, we are working on these angles and really this is also the long-term strategy we see for, or we need to develop right now for the forum how to work with these different um, stakeholders in actually, but still aiming for the same same overall goal. Yeah, that's that's really fascinating work. That is challenging work at, yes. at the moment uh, because you might be afraid that you're losing, you know, some members or you're you're even losing people. Yeah? So, yeah. and it is so interesting to also see, you know, how um, extremely important a diverse civil society. Um, kind of a setup of civil society organizations is you can see this at the moment in Ukraine where there were lots of um, organization within the country that is non-military organization and, and keeping up uh, things and keeping you know kind of um, helping people etc is 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 only possible because Ukraine had such a strong civil society organization and and so uh, it's it's quite quite a fascinating part of of your work uh, tell us a little bit more you know like not only the acute situation but if you look back a couple of years you know like uh, when the when the frictions were not as bad as they are at the moment uh, can you give us an example where for example the civil society forum was able to influence policy because of of the positioning you know that you could um, develop together or or any other strategies mm -hmm. um yeah i i could give uh, i think a couple of examples um maybe those of um yeah of working on a maybe not so visible uh, changes uh, within policies or within the society and those also aiming um at the yeah at at uh, bigger uh, decision making um from the um, maybe uh, personal or, or smaller stories that I would like to share. Uh, we've been um, seeing in the last 10 years, as I mentioned in the beginning, we had more civil society organizations engaged that were already working with Eastern Europe or that had this um, since the end of the Soviet Union or the 1990s, the idea of, um, of uh, cooperating uh, with um, Russia and other uh, post-Soviet uh, states. And this has really changed within the last years. And um, I am very 
glad and honored that we have a lot of organizations joining that are joining because of the topics or of the topical work that um, that can really um, yeah connect them to other people and I, I always bring the example we had an Italian uh, and a Russian organization from Yoshkar Ola which is a small a republic within Russia that were working on prisoners' rights. And these Italian peoples had never anything to do with, with Russia, but they were experts on, on, on legal advice uh, to prisons. And we had very, um, very uh, strong and powerful um, and also uh, successful uh, projects with um, advocating for prisoners' rights in this small uh, region of Russia. So we have actually um, yeah, worked on different, on different also regions regional levels we were also um maybe this is was kind of um in the media also you heard of it it was a big protest called shies in russia in the north um against um rubbish damp that should have been built for moscow people in the beautiful forest, forest of the russian north and this was a big civil movement where also many of our member organizations were active uh, very broad with students with elderly people with huge camps uh, in the forest um, trying to stop the construction works and actually these this dam has never been built um, wow. so uh, legally it is still still this process is still going on it is not officially stopped but it, it wasn't taken further so these are some smaller um some smaller well this not so small but uh, some um, rather not so visible signs that i see that we as csf and also other civil society initiatives um in in, in the larger sense where we're active and um yeah and um you know that's quite interesting because it, it sounds like a wide range of topics that okay. the ngos are active in uh, civil society organizations you know like you you talked about prisoners right and and you talked about environmental issues so is there a certain tendency in in russia for civil society organizations where you can say oh this is possible you know this is okay you know this is like granted and, and other topics not is there any any range of topics yes um yes uh, there are slight or there are some some islands <laughs> i could say um of topics that um there was uh, that were also still supported by um, the municipalities or other structures within russia um right now i would say this is also like within the last couple of weeks um i wouldn't take that for granted but um we or i in my work also as you mentioned uh, i was living in russia for a longer time we were very much working with the topic of urban environment um, um urban development uh, participative participatory practices of changing neighborhoods um, um um certain districts and so on so this was always um also a good example to do cross-sectoral work still in russian regions um the topic of sustainability um was also um still open and very much open for different also international uh collaborations um climate and climate change and environmental change uh, we have many member ngos also long working member ngos from russia uh, working uh, with climate topics um and yeah i think these these fields uh, were more or less um, doable and also welcome in the last years um, and on the other way around uh, topics like like human rights like free media um, other yep. as i mentioned already legal support have always been difficult but it's also a little bit a way of, of wording of posing of course when we talk about the right to the city we also talk about human rights so um i think our agenda yep. is, is present even though we might have a little bit of a different approach and a different topical yeah. Yeah, uh, sense. So, so Barbara, if you had to kind of quickly, I know it's a bit of a challenge, but quickly summarize, you know, like uh, the three most important um, things that you say can be done for civil society organizations, let's say in difficult, in difficult situations in authoritarian states. Um, what is the, 
the most important support that the forum can actually give? Uh, the most important support is that the forum exists and that the forum exists because of people and because of organizations. So even though, even if our grants will stop, if we it's do a network have, between people, yeah, yes, it's a network between people and we see it right now, it exists and existed the last years during the, the COVID pandemic, which was already a, um, yeah, um, a situation we, we, that was more than challenging. So it exists, it is independent and it functions as long as the members are active and are holding up this space. And I see right now that it is, it's there, it's active, it's um, no matter what happens, we, uh, we do have the contacts, we do have the communication and nobody can take that away from us. Um, no government and also no, no sanctions. And um, I think this is the strongest sign we can give our, to our members. And we, like, the, we have the collective voice. Uh, we have maybe smaller NGOs or just regional, uh, as I said, initiators collectives, but we have this voice, we have this body for our common topics. Um, and that makes us more visible and stronger and also um, showing a constant sign of of solidarity as well. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. It's it's actually quite nice to say uh, that, that our topic of governance is actually so human. It's it's not only human, it's humane, it's it's the network between uh, people. Uh, and the network also needs to be always consolidated in some kind of structure. So that's the yes. visibility and that's the strength. So fantastic, you know, we have two more <laughs> really fascinating um, yeah, topics. So uh, Barbara, I thank you a lot for being here, for um, joining us mm -hmm. today. And um, at the moment, I just Pleasure. wish you all the best and the strength um, to just continue the work that you can do. And uh, you. yes, with that, I hand over back to Lola Kwa to introduce um, our next speaker. Thank you, Lola Kwa. Thank you so much, Barbara. Thank you so much, Petra. Um, oh my goodness. Um, sometimes I get a little bit excited. Um, I'm reading the chat, I'm listening to the speakers, but also I have to calm myself down a little bit because right now the hat that I'm wearing is that um, of being a CLI staff member. Before I introduce the next speaker, um, I would just like to do one housekeeping. I think, um, so Barbara and Petra, there is a beautiful question that we have on the chat. It is coming from Supriya. And I may actually think that when you're sharing with us, you know, the three things towards the end of your delivery, you may have perhaps already touched on the response. So if you could please make your way to the chat um, and see the question that we have here from Supriya. Hi, Supriya. And then secondly, together with my colleagues um, at CLI, we would like you uh, to think about, you know, still under the governance umbrella, to think about uh, for you or in the work that um, you have been doing, how do you see us learning collectively and also navigating differences. So you can either do this um, in a form of responses that are just one word. We want to create a word cloud that we will look at towards the end of the session. So if you look at the chat box, uh, you already have the question there and also a link that you can click on and it will take you there where you can record um, your responses on what you think um, should actually be how we learn collectively and also how we navigate differences as we look towards governance as that important um, part of the work that we are doing. So as I was listening to uh, Barbara and about to be talking to um, Eddie, I also thought a little bit about um, the role that um, the role that uh, civil society plays, you know, in various countries, in various uh, uh, contexts. 
And it also reminded me um, of the role also that was played by civil society in South Africa, but also the international community in solidarity with South Africa before the democratic elections, um, when we still have the apartheid regime. And when I look at this, I just want to remind us that um, strong civil society organizations really function um, as that checks and balances in society. And I would um, already see them as a shortcut for us to really do what Leander spoke about earlier, you know, have them either as movements, as associations that are part, for example, of um, a discussion or a finalization of a certain policy uh, in a country. And they not only function as checks and balances, but they also bring in concerns that we sometimes overlook. For example, they will highlight these problems and also show us uh, better pathways into better futures. So I think um, what we have learned also from CLI, as you may have had us, if you have worked with us, is that we take those exercises of uh, stakeholder mapping and stakeholder exercise, because when we talk about a system, that's exactly what we are talking about, a collaboration um, ecosystem that is inclusive of everyone. And civil society organizations, associations, or movement usually help us with bringing in the voice of those people whom we usually uh, forget or perhaps not really engage in the process and just maybe continue with the technical side of things. And when that happens, it actually shows then uh, the cracks in our governance uh, systems. And with that, I am going to invite on our virtual stage, Mr. Edi Chikota. Edi Chukuta is actually joining us from Zambia. And a little bit um, about Edi, he is joining us today wearing the hat of being the contact person, the coordinator, and the person who tells us everything that is about the Lusaka Water Security Initiative. And also, um, he will tell us a little bit of what it is about but also he will share perhaps how he found his way to Lucy. But most importantly, we also um, want to, 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 to hear about Lucy's impact in uh, Zambia's and perhaps Lusaka City uh, water governance. So Lucy uh, will now have the stage through Mr. Eddie Chikuta. You have the floor. Thank you, uh, Lulekwa, and uh, thank you for the kind words. Um, um, Lucy, uh, I will give you a small background. Um, the water and sanitation situation in Lusaka is quite a unique one, and also in the different parts of the city of, uh, um, uh, in Zambia. So we see there's a lot of investment that goes on to improve the wash and the water resources management. But now we found ourselves in a situation where the situation doesn't improve. Year in, year out, there are a lot of investments that donors have brought in, and there's no improvement to ensure that uh, the water security situation actually for the city is changed. So in 2013, different partners came together and said, there is a problem here, and we need to find the solution here. And one of the things that was identified is that institutions, either government, civil society, private sector, actually working in silos. And the silos mentality is really creating a lot of havoc, duplication of efforts in the water sector, and also creating a, a situation where we are not addressing the issues that we want to address by the end of the day. So a platform was conceived called the Lusaka Water Security Initiative to bring together different stakeholders around a collective action on promoting water security at a city level. So this means bringing different private sector entities, government institutions, civil society institutions, and communities to rally behind the water security agenda for the city of Lusaka. So that's how Lusaka water security uh, came into place. 
And our value proposition basically lies on a few uh, aspects. One, we exist to ensure that we create this platform for horizontal um, partnerships and relationships, but also we are a platform that creates a platform to incubate ideas around water security aspects, but also it's a platform to ensure that we help different actors in the sector realize synergies because we want to ensure that different partners are actually working together in the sector uh, to address the diverse water security issues but also we act strategically to ensure that we are an incubator of ideas at city level and also ensure that we do uh, what we call resource pooling for water security um, projects so over the years we have grown 2013, 2016, from 16 members, we now have about 33 formidable international, local, as well as uh, private sector partners who've come on board to form the Lucy uh, collaboration platform. So what we essentially are is that we are an, a multi-stakeholder platform where water security aspects are actually being discussed collaboratively between and among different partners, ideation of projects, resource pooling, sharing of technical expertise as well as brainstorming around a lot of collective action and one thing and i think i was excited when petra was trying to actually define governance she was indicating mostly in the public sector governance is viewed from one angle it's basically the structures but when we came to now look at the governance aspect under the lucy umbrella different partners did agree that governance beyond, goes beyond the structures it involves the partnerships, it involves capacity building aspects, it involves different, a whole range of aspects that will ensure that water security uh, is actually achieved for the city of Lusaka. And for us, we are proud, I think we are one of the first formidable uh, platforms uh, which has been established as a nonprofit, but has the interest of private sector and presence of private sector, government institutions, uh, civil society organizations as commu and communities as well to ensure that we harmonize different aspects and projects and activities which promote water security for the city of Lusaka. So what we did and what we have done is that we have created what uh, we now call a water security strategic framework for the city of Lusaka, which different partners have actually agreed to, to say this is our water security uh, strategic framework because it provides more or less like a water security strategic agenda for the city of Lusaka of how we are going to collaboratively address the water security aspects for the city of Lusaka. And we have chosen basically four aspects that we're working on, issues of safeguarding uh, the water resources and, and also water resource management, issues around wash access, issues around the green city movement and disaster risk reduction. So those are the four key aspects. So we have been innovating around quite a number of um, uh, activities and projects, and also building capacity of the different institutions uh, in the water and, uh, and uh, water and sanitation sector in Zambia. So what we have done, not only have we become a platform, but we have transitioned ourselves into a critical instrument, even at policy level, where government has recognized the need for multi-stakeholder platforms as a critical step in ensuring that we actually uh, uh, achieve our water security um, uh, goals that we have for the country, as well as for Lusaka as well. So currently the Ministry of Water Development and, and, and Sanitation for Zambia sits as the patron for the Lusaka Water Security Initiative, because we have entrenched ourselves and our modality of, uh, of, of, of co-creation and co-production in government policy as well. And they have now seen the relevance of actually bringing these different stakeholders who we represent as a platform to actually even the policy instruments such as the water policy, such as the eighth national development plan, the climate change national adaptation plan. So before there's any approval that happens, the engagement actually has to go through the platform to ensure that the diverse views of not only the NGOs, but the private sector, because private sector also has got a huge bearing on the water security situation for the city of Lusaka, because we have a thousand industries, 
and a lot of trade effluent is seeping into the aquifers and in the environment and polluting actually most of the water resources that we have and water recharge areas. So how do we start changing the narrative from government led initiatives, but to also private sector led initiatives on the platform to ensure that there's also investments and exploring different financing mechanisms for promoting water security, such as blended finance, as well as green financing instruments, green bonds and other instruments to promote water security. So we are proud really as we represent different institutions, but also where the face of different partners that range from private sector, as well as uh, the normal community members that community level there to hear their views also so that we can actually represent those views into the wider discussions on water security. Wow, so I will start with Ben Roberts's comment, which I believe that it will one of it, it, it's going to be one of the slogans that I'm taking yeah. with out of here is that governance goes beyond structures and it also it involves partnerships and relationships. I think this is also something that Dominic touched on yesterday when we were having when we were having this discussion on LinkedIn. But also, Eddie, this reminds me when we were in Zambia in 2016, almost every after three weeks, I remember, you know, um, we were sitting in one of the meetings and um, one of the comments that came from the stakeholders um, was that we've been talking about this. We've been all saying that we want this to be a multi-stakeholder or we want this initiative to have this multi-stakeholder um, approach. And we need to do it right this time. We cannot be having all of these workshops. And Dominic and I, we looked and thought, oh my goodness, there's so much work that we need to do here. And now as we speak, uh, Lucy is, you know, um, a formidable uh, network platform organization on its own. So I want you perhaps to share with us and the audience, how did you manage to iron out those differences? How did you manage to navigate through all of those conversations and also the actual engagement process, which I believe was not easy before 2016. So how did it get to a place where Lucy is at now? There's also um, this uh, steering board that is involved, but also there are actually projects that are led by the private sector. Because if you remember also in 2016, there was that beautiful moment when um, one of the private sector people actually made a pledge that this is what they wanted to contribute in terms of dollars, you know, for the pipeline, because work has to be done now. So take us through briefly in five minutes, how did you move from differences to saying, ah, okay, we can now sit around the same table. Thank you. Um, it, it is not an easy process because one of the things is that we recognize the different interests and also different aspirations of different partners and organizations in the sector and in Zambia generally. So the first thing that we needed to do is to galvanize collective understanding of what water security is and how actually everyone regardless of their industry classification influences water in one way or the other. So whether you're a private sector entity manufacturing still, there is a way that you are actually influencing or actually affecting water security in one way or the other. So the first thing was about creating an understanding around the water security agenda for the city. What are we doing? what are the impacts of this so that people and businesses first they understand that it be it's beyond the profits that they make but the environmental aspect actually are quite very critical to to this process and we married that with the conversation around water stewardship as well why do businesses why should private sector why should communities actually commit to this agenda so it wasn't an easy process, but we saw with continuous engagements and also different discussions that we had with different people, they started opening up to these ideas of water security, and we married it with water stewardship awards 
to incentivize actually industries that are leading into water security uh, projects and other issues. So now every private sector wanted to be part of the initiative because they know that the value one in their publicity Two, also in terms of they are doing quite a lot of work around environmental stewards, they will be recognized and they need to contribute in one way or the other. So it wasn't an easy process, but with time, the understanding was actually built. And one thing that also I think is a critical aspect is that the Lucy platform has created a horizontal space where there is some form of equality in terms of discussion. So you see there are private, big private sector entities such as Zambian breweries, but there's also government which is seated on Lucy. When we are discussing under Lucy, there is actually no boss of some sort to say, this is what you need to do. So they are discussing, they are engaging, and they're actually collaborating in different aspects. So we are happy that actually from this collective action, we've been able to have different projects that have been spearheaded by uh, private sector entities that are paying for, uh, for, for, for huge sums, uh, paying huge sums of money to implement actually quite a wide range of activities from water supply, from wash, from community empowerment to information management, data management, different aspects around water security. And for us, this is where I think we can clap our hands and say this is what we wanted, because if private sector are able to see the reason why they should actually invest part of their profits into some of these activities, then for us, it's a good thing. So we are actually quite very happy. And with that commitment, other partners have been able to see now that this is actually the modus operandi of how things actually should be done in the water sector. So we are glad to indicate that we've got quite big institutions on the Lucy platform. We've got UNICEF, we've got GIZ, we've got Water Aid, we have Zambian breweries, we have Coca-Cola, we have Zambif, we have quite a huge, we actually even have uh, Rock Blue, a South African led, I think, NGO, which is also part of Lucy. So other partners outside the country have now seen the realization of what we are doing and they're actually joining the collaboration platform to actually learn and actually see how they can actually replicate some of the issues and discussions that we're having within the platform to actually externalize. So what Lucy has now become, it has now become more or less the conduit between government as well as the different industry players. So we sit quite strategic in the middle. Now that we have the strength of government on one hand, because the minister now is the patron for Lucy and everything that happens now, the influence actually is quite very um, uh, strategic and the legitimacy is there from different partners. So the private sector actually wants to be part of that because if they want to get to the minister, they easy platform to get through to the minister and other government um, departments is actually through the platform where they can actually air their views and plan with the government and see how best they can actually engage uh, co uh, co co to co-produce and co-create some of the innovations around uh, water security. So for us, I think we are proud of this and I think it's something that we are always sharing with different uh, partners as well in country and out of the country to see how best actually water security can be addressed. So I'm always feeling after each and every speaker that I have more questions, but I must also stick to the pro, uh, program. So to all um, our, our attendees and the audience, that is here with us today. I think from that last part from Eddie, we can also um, start having an idea of the impact that Lucy is playing. Because if such a platform manages to have this strategic position where it's also connecting government and private sector who are usually in conflict, we have seen in Southern Africa. So this is a good thing, but um, Eddie, I am going to go to the next speaker, but before I do that, I also have a request for you as well. There is another beautiful message um, or question rather that I think uh, will require you to elaborate a little bit more, uh, for example, in terms of how this was done in, in, in Lusaka, Zambia. 
So um, Ben Roberts there has a question for you. So as we are welcoming the next speaker, please take the time to also respond via the chat function. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And also Dominic Thank says you. hi. Thank so, you. Um, Yes, but I, I, I think we will need to have more, I mean, more time when we have this uh, conversation again. Leander said something to me that I think we also need to unpack it as well, that, um, you know, governance is also such a contested term. So when we talk about governance, we really have to peel each layer because there is so much that can actually uh, we can talk about and also share examples and recommendations from the work that we've been doing. So now up next, let's see uh, to my team. I would now like to invite Mr. Ahmed. Mr. Ahmed is joining us from Morocco and will be sharing with us um, their lessons as well from their done platform that is looking at local economic development, also through the support of entrepreneurs in really making sure that there is a creation of jobs, but also for young people. Before he starts, um, Ahmed has an interesting CV, and I'll just say a few lines of his CV. So um, he is an agricultural engineer with more than 20 years of experience in local development projects. But he has also been working as a senior advisor for GIZ. And also before that, he has also worked for the UNDP and also various other organizations. So he is also an experienced facilitator of these multi-stakeholder uh, processes and also really gives us his expertise around this idea on how do we really uh, start to talk about uh, economic development and support of our entrepreneurs and also have this dialogue that leads to collaboration that also leads to action. I will stop there because I can talk until the, the cows come home. So Mr. Ahmed, I would like to hand over to you and I will also request Andy, my colleague, to start sharing this PowerPoint. Over to you, Mr. Ahmed. Okay, okay. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Lulikwa, for this, uh, this uh, uh, introduction. So um, uh, I said, I say uh, good evening uh, for uh, everybody. So th first of all, I, I, I'm a very, uh, I'm very proud uh, to be here with you. And I would like to thank the Collective Leadership Institute for giving me this, uh, this opportunity to share with you uh, this experience in supporting uh, local uh, local uh, governance uh, and facilitation the multi-stakeholder collaboration process. So uh, this, uh, this experience concerns uh, a multi-stakeholder dialogue process uh, in, at the local level, at the local level that lead uh, to a partnership uh, around the establishment of a platform to promote the local economy and uh, support the young uh, entrepreneurship. Um, uh, next slide, please. So uh, I think that it's important to mention that uh, the, this, this experience uh, is part uh, of GIZ project, uh, project, PEDEL project, which is a partnership between uh, GIZ and uh, Ontario Ministry of uh, uh, Kingdom of Morocco. So uh, this initiative uh, took uh, place at the provincial level so in Morocco, we have a national, a regional, and provincial level, uh, and particularly in, uh, in uh, Warzazet province, uh, which is located uh, in the south of the Kingdom of Morocco. So the, the, beginning, the beginning of this experience that starts with, uh, with the implementation, creation, a provincial economic development committee, which is uh, a, a framework, governance framework, uh, in order to, to animate and catalyze an institutional dialogue between 
uh, between actors from uh, adm administration, public, uh, pri a pri a private actor, and, and a civil uh, or society organization uh, around the, the key issues of local economic development in order to create uh, revenue and uh, employment for, uh, for young and, and uh, women. Uh, next, okay. So uh, here, uh, 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 as you see, uh, this is the the process, uh, the process of the the, the collaboration. Uh, it's a dialogue process. Was uh, this dialogue process was uh, structured in uh, four uh, phases? So the the process duration is about uh, 20, uh, 20 months, and it was uh, launched uh, just after. Uh, the institutionalization of the, the committee, the CPDE, uh, in April uh, uh, 20, uh, 20, uh, 2016. So the, the first phase uh, concerned the, the preparation of the process, uh, uh, particularly on term of uh, um, the commitment of the case stakeholders and also to have a common uh, understanding on the the potentiality, the economic uh, potentialities and, uh, and challenges that limit uh, economic growth. The, after the second phases uh, that took uh, the, long, the, longest, uh, uh, the longest time, uh, and it, it was a question, because it was, it was question of agreement on a priority subjects for the actors, and uh, fix the, the objectives, the, the strategy, strategy, and the resources uh, to be mobilized. Uh, after the third phase was focused on uh, consolidation, uh, consolidation, the, the agreement, the agreement and creation a new management structure for the platform, which uh, which took the form of uh, of uh, foundation. The, the last phase, which uh, which which um, which continue until now, which continue until now, concerns the the implementation of the activities uh, and the mobilization of the human and and uh, logistical uh, and finance resources necessary for the implementation of the platform. So, uh, in terms of uh, of uh, workflow, um, this this process um, has seen. Uh, uh, um, about uh, 30 days of, uh, of a reflection as uh, 115 hours of collective work, like a meeting, a workshop, uh, a conference, exchange visit, and official meeting with, uh, with, uh, with the decider. And also uh, it's, it has, has seen uh, 10, 10, uh, about a 10 training session uh, not only uh, technical te teams, but also in uh, in uh, in competence or uh, and dialogic uh, skills. Uh, also, um, this process has seen um, the participation of uh, 400 actors uh, from uh, different uh, uh, different kind of uh, of act public, private, and civil society uh, uh, organization. Um, if you can, uh, the next, uh, the next slide. Okay, here, here, um, just uh, some illustrative photos of uh, diverse meeting and uh, workshop uh, of work and dialogue uh, uh, carried out by, by the, the the committee. So, um, but but here, I'm, I'm, I would like I would like to to highlight that um, it, that this process was not easy, not not easy to implement. Uh, view that the, the interest and the, the perspectives uh, of the actors were, was not always um, the same, and sometimes uh, we we find them uh, in state of uh, divergence, uh, conflictual interest. Um, uh, but uh, with the, with the, with the support of CLE, we have uh, been uh, careful uh, from the beginning, and we make effort to uh, to not reduce the. The dialogue only on the technical aspects and expertise, but also uh, take into consideration uh, the human and, uh, and social aspects uh, that are very important uh, to try to overcome uh, 
some uh, interpersonal conflict or political uh, differences or uh, some uh, this uh, this tr this uh, uh, trust uh, between uh, uh, some actors so uh, uh, can you can you um, uh, next slide okay uh, on the next the next slide okay okay here here just for uh, don't show this uh, this uh, this process uh, uh, after this hard and non constructive dialogue process the uh, the stakeholders agree uh, agree to federate their resources and uh, and skills uh, around uh, to achieve a strategy a vision that consists of uh, establish uh, a provincial uh, platform project for economic uh, pro promotion and support for entrepreneurship uh, that is uh, a, a mechanism that will facilitate the, the convergence and synergy of various initiatives and programs intended uh, to, uh, to boost the local economy and implement uh, and uh, promote employment for, for young. So, uh, and, uh, and this platform, uh, 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 so it's, uh, it, it was a create of a new structure named the uh, uh, um, initiative was that foundation uh, shared by all actors uh, that will uh, uh, ensure the management uh, of, of the platform. Uh, and, and next slide, please. Okay, th th this, um, this diagram uh, presents the, uh, the, the category of actors involved in the, the platform. Uh, the, the, there is actually 21 actors from uh, public administration, uh, professional chamber, uh, civil society organization, uh, a commune, and, uh, and also the, the private sector. So the, the main mission of the platform, uh, which is currently management, managed by the, the, the foundation, the, the fund, what is that initiative foundation, uh, is to federate and mobilize the, the technical and financial resources uh, of the actors in order to promote the local economy and employment. And the, and the, 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 the platform is based on the three, um, on three uh, pillars. You, you can uh, just, uh, Okay, uh, the, the, the platform is based on a three uh, pillar of action. Um, the first is the, to improve uh, services to access to information. It's uh, very important, uh, especially for private sector. Uh, encourage and support uh, a very small and small enterprise, enterprise, uh, enterprise and support um, a value chain, a value chain that have a, a very uh, potential to to growth and create uh, revenue and uh, employment for local population. Uh, next slide, slide, please. Okay, so here uh, just uh, um, I, I, I would like to, to, to share with you some results uh, for, 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 from this experience. So uh, actually uh, uh, there is a provincial uh, fund uh, for economic province uh, promotion and employment is mobilized by the, 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 the principal uh, by the, the key, uh, the key um, uh, stakeholder. Uh, also uh, uh, advice and support a, a unit for young people with, uh, with business creation idea uh, have been set up in, in the centers of the municipalities of the province uh, there is also a network of local entrepreneurship advisor uh, are tra uh, trained and uh, made uh, available to, to young uh, entrepreneurs uh, in the province and also a, a mechanism of uh, a finance a financial service uh, in the form of, uh, of, uh, of loan but uh, with the free interest uh, has been set, uh, set up for a benefit for the benefit of young people with innovative ideas for entrepreneur. Uh, next, uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, so um, uh, finally, uh, I, I would like just to uh, to share with you uh, some uh, some uh, some key factors to 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 the success. Uh, the, the first one is uh, the, the high quality of process facilitation. It's uh, it's very very important the facilitation for this process for this governance process. Um, 
also um, uh, uh, the, 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 the engagement, the individual and institutional engagement of, of the key uh, uh, partner uh, and, uh, 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 and um, a, concert, a concerted and uh, shared the vision allowing to integrate the objectives uh, and the perspectives of the actors uh, a credible and competent steering structure that uh, manage the platform and uh, coordinates the actions and uh, the transparency and shared monitoring and evaluation system uh, that make uh, uh, transparency information and share a result with all actors. Uh, okay, oh, thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, you, thank you for that presentation. And you have already answered some of the questions that I had, Ahmed. But mm -hmm. I still have one question that I would like to ask you. So as I was listening, I can already imagine that, uh, as you said, that this was not easier because it involved a lot of uh, engagement of uh, the stakeholders, engaging them individually, but also engaging them collectively. You also mentioned that you had um, various convening moments where there were workshops, there were information uh, sessions, there were conferences, um, et cetera. This is not easy. And as I'm listening also, and when I read up, on, on this initiative. Um, it was a complex process that had a lot of uh, stakeholders. And the one thing for me that I would like to ask is, is, is around trust, right? In order for such a platform to actually exist and function, there has to be a certain level of trust and you also mentioned perhaps the first answer, which is high quality facil facilitation. But can you say a little bit more, how did you get this collection of stakeholders to a level where there was enough trust for this dialogue platform to actually exist as a uh, credible platform? How did you get around trust, making sure that trust was also the glue that brings everyone together. Okay, okay, uh, th thank you uh, for, for, this, uh, for this interesting question. Uh, so I, I think uh, um, trust, uh, trust we, can, we can buy or sell trust. Trust, we, we have to build, build this trust between all, all uh, uh, partners or actors. So um, uh, we have mainly based uh, on uh, um, uh, the need to achieve uh, 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 to achieve a rapid or uh, uh, what we call a quick win. It's very important to have the quick wins uh, for uh, and mobilize and 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 engage uh, engage um, uh, actors uh, and also um, make a, a transparency in in the sharing. In the sharing information uh, about uh, the activities, uh, about uh, uh, the, the results, and sharing and sharing the results as the effort of all participants, uh, uh, and all, not only of uh, on some, some other. It's uh, it's a very important uh, that that is very important to uh, to, to to build this this trust and engage actor to collaborate uh, collectively. I agree. I agree. Uh, thank you so much for this. And if I connect, uh, Mr. Ahmed, what you have just said uh, to what um, Eddie has said, and also to what uh, Leander shared with us earlier, is that um, governance perhaps is not only just this ugly word that makes us think about laws, you know, uh, and committees but it is also a word or a concept um, or something that we can use as a mechanism that also um, uh, has the face of partnerships, 
um, where trust can be built, where relationships uh, can be built. And also, if I may quote you as well, um, where innovation can also come out of uh, you know, good governance uh, mechanisms, but also where equity, I think that's what Eddie also said, and also where there's transparency, because a governance uh, process that has no transparency uh, usually leads to uh, results that maybe you do not want to see. But also Leander has said that um, uh, good, good governance is also characterized by the participation of um, every stakeholder uh, sector that should be part of uh, that particular initiative. So thank you so much for this. And I would now like to call upon my colleagues as we move on to the next part. So remember, Elia, we asked you uh, to fill in uh, this link where we had this question and now Petra will take us through uh, the next part and also show us uh, the results that came out of that. Over to you, Petra. Thank you. Thank you, Lelekwa, and uh, thank you to Ahmed. That was really interesting. And I think there are lots of learnings uh, from, from this session uh, and, and certain messages around governments that really carry through. So can I maybe ask my colleague, Andy, to show us the results from the Mentimeter? And uh, let's just see what we can hear. So what I think came through all the presentations is accept differences and have the, the appreciation and the respect. I'm just wondering if there's also something on listening. Oh yes, there's listen, listen, listen. Uh, there is uh, something about complementarity and uh, the, the ability of people to change perspectives through the, the multi-stakeholder dialogue process, the consultation processes, the network processes that actually need to take place. So uh, it, but, but it's also lovely to see the scene with the heart so in, in terms of it. Um, I think all the presentations showed that it is the, the multi-stakeholder uh, dialogues around governance processes actually are more than just the theme, more than the technical expertise, more than just simply the, the content, but it is also about people meeting people in a different way. And uh, so thank you, Andy, for, for that, to give us an uh, impression of the, the Mentimeter. And let me just uh, summarize a little bit what I've heard and, and what this tells us about transformation literacy. I think what was actually uh, amazing to hear was that governance is, is a, a broad term that entails also the quality of process. So it entails the quality of, of dialogues and uh, the quality of, um, or, they, uh, or let's say the investment in human relationships, because sometimes when we are in thinking about transformations, it can happen that we, we, yeah, we narrow down on all the technical issues. And I think the water governance was an extremely interesting example where, uh, you know, in the beginning, you might say it's all technical, it can be solved, but if there isn't a right engagement of people, it, it, the, the best techniques, the best methodologies don't really work. So it is really about overcoming silos. It is about working together in a different way. And I think what made it so clear uh, across all the, all the contributions, you know, from, uh, from the uh, from the local uh, economic development, you know, to water governance, to migration gov governments, but also to the to the platform, uh, the civil society forum, is that uh, governance is is based on us being able to become collectively intelligent, and uh, often that means that we need to be pretty patient. Uh, and that is not uh, the kettle of fish of everybody. We need to be pretty patient in the sense of being able to look at different perspectives and stand with these different perspectives and um, dig a little bit deeper and try to understand, you know, what is behind these different 
perspectives. This is so absolutely crucial because with that capability to, to listen and uh, embrace, even when the perspectives are those that we may not be able to understand <laughs> immediately, uh, with that ability to embrace different perspectives, we can actually uh, move forward. And interesting, what I found very, very fascinating, and of course, this is also my, my experience in, in, I don't know, 20, 30 years of, uh, of supporting such processes, is that we may in the beginning think, you know, all these, these, these engagement processes, all these dialogues, all these kind of uh, getting different stakeholders together, is somehow a, a buy-in, you know, that, that is a term that is often often being used. And, you know, on a superficial level, that may be the case, but um, all the examples showed that it is much more than just simply a buy-in um, regarding an issue that um, somebody else has decided is the, 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 the issue that makes most sense. Well, what I think what we've heard is that uh, around governance, the central issue around governance is really collective learning. So the ability of people uh, through that dialogue to be able to to move together in a in a much more useful direction. And what I've also heard, what what came through, and that's so interesting, that the the way of of organizing good processes, good governance processes, um, are important because people get to know each other in a different way and that makes life in cooperation so much more easy so i think all of those who who have been going through the arduous processes of of consultation and multi-stakeholder dialogues and multi-stakeholder collaboration know once you have reached a point where you can just quickly get onto your mobile and phone somebody and say you know there's an issue you know can we solve this together or do you have an idea or do you know somebody who knows somebody who can help um, if, if that level is reached you actually have that spirit of of wanting to lead things uh, collectively in a, in a in a better direction so that that is an an amazing often neglected side effect from platforms and networks and joint initiatives, multi-stakeholder initiatives, multi-stakeholder dialogues. So, so I find this an extremely interesting learning. And what I also loved from all the, all the um, contributors and all the, the presentations uh, that, it, you know, there are tangible outputs. There are really tangible results. So uh, I think, Leanna, you, you had an example of one process is where people wanted to be fast. And uh, yet then there was a level of ownership lacking and a level of identification. So that issue of identifying with the result is so important in governance processes. And uh, it is so important because that is what makes implementation easier. And that is a big learning in transformative change. So what I do not want to neglect in terms of governance processes are structures. We, we, I think we agreed on this fabulous quote from Eddie, uh, yes. And yet at the same time, uh, we've also seen, you know, across all the contributors that a governance at some stage, not in the beginning, requires some kind of structure so some kind of network that is a little bit more institutionalized um, moving this into a nonprofit organization or uh, some kind of structure that is an entity where people can relate to because most often and we can can see this in, in lucy in the, in the water given governance once that has been reached uh, the the multi-stakeholder organization because these are actually multi-stakeholder organizations and I would even even call the civil society forum a multi-stakeholder organization although you know you don't have private sector in you don't have governments in etc but but you do have a very wide range of different stakeholders and once there is this uh, structure reached then usually um there is a this is established in a way that it can also grow and then new stakeholders can refer to that in a different way so it is governance and structures are 
important. So it is important at some stage, I always say not at the beginning, uh, but at some stage to move uh, governance into structures. So, um, and uh, yeah, in order to be able to round this up a little bit, I would like to refer back to our different transformation enablers, because um, the, the search architecture actually says that in order to bring about transformative change, large scale, small scale, medium scale, we need to look at these different transformation enablers and all of them are a kind of lens, a kind of perspective. And that's so interesting. That's almost like a, a mirror of multi-stakeholder processes. So we need these different lenses, these different, different entry points. And it is so interesting that uh, governance is is uh, bringing networks of people together and enabling people to meet people as people and to understand stories and backgrounds and expertise and knowledge etc and uh with, with multi-stakeholder dialogues and processes won't work without having or developing narratives together that are future narratives and that are positive narratives around the doability of change and they want to work without changing the structures and overcoming the silos and actually creating collaboration structures and structures for collective action that that really work and um even important we had a we had a session on metrics it is important to say how do we actually monitor progress and how do we monitor process so that is even important and it is also interesting to look at the relationship between governance and innovation. We had a session on innovation where it was really about how we bring the new into the world and, and can guide this you know, towards sustainability. And uh, for, the, for the last session, and Lilico will say a little bit more about it, uh, we really look at what are the binding agreements, you know, we call them regulations. What are the binding and voluntary agreements that are so important? for transformative change. So with that, I would say I'm going to hand over for the closing session to Lulequa. Thank you so much, Petra. Um, let's see, we are left with uh, four and a half minutes before we bring this session to a close. And those four and a half minutes, which will translate to four minutes, I will share them with Dr. Leander. So, Isela, if you could please help me share the screen with Leander. So, Leander, hi, are you here with me? Okay, so sure. I will request the assistant of my colleagues. So you have about one minute, 45 seconds um, wow. to do the closing, and then we will have um, a message for our audience. Right, so thank you very much. I just wanted to highlight the work that uh, CLI has done in, in Ghana, which is uh, really instrumental because in my presentation, I talked about the lack of sustainability and the fact that governance uh, has to be comprehensive and all encompassing of actors beyond the usual suspects of government ministries, departments, and then agencies. So with the CLI training that took place in Ghana, it involved uh, stakeholders um, like civil society organizations, the private sector, NGOs, and so on and so forth. And I, I personally think that that has really created a new type of energy within the migration governance system in the country. And uh, it led to the creation of uh, five different groups, and these groups are working very hard. There, there's a lot of joint learning that is taking place. And then it has moved from policy development to implementation. And uh, what I did also acknowledge was the fact that I, I also facilitate uh, multi-stakeholder dialogues on behalf of the GFA uh, consultancy firm. And we worked closely with Douglas and then Luleka. So um, I'll just wrap up by saying that um, sustainability is key, involving uh, multiple partners is key, and then the work that CLI is doing is fantastic. So thank you very much for all the contribution. Keep it up. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And we now come to the end of our session. 
And um, before we do that, I would first like to give my sincere appreciation to everyone that has taken the time to be with us today. We do recognize that um, we are once again faced with so much that is happening in the world. And therefore we really do appreciate the time that you give us and the time that you make for us. So thank you so much for being part of our Transformation Literacy Conference. Mm -hmm. And now I want to go to our panelists. Oh my goodness. So um, Dr. Leanda, the beautiful Miss Barbara Ann Benzmaya, and also Mr. Ahmed, and also my brother, Eddie. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for uh, agreeing, you know, without uh, being paid that um, you wanted to share with us in these conversations that we also wanted to share with others. And thank you so much for also giving us time to learn from you and really have this inspiration to think anew in terms of also what it means for us to invite others into a conversation on transformation literacy. And also, I want to thank my team, my colleagues, um, to Andy, Esela, Nastia, Kiara, and also everyone in the office, and also Teresa, for everything that you're doing behind the scenes, really helping us, making sure that um, we can deliver these talks in a way that uh, people can also have access to them. I want to thank you as well. And also to say again, from the chat field, you should already be seeing a link that is the link to our book, which is Leading Transformative Change. Collectively, you have access to it. You can use it for your team, for your organization. And also we do have a certification program that you can also be part of, um, which Leander also is part of. So please take a look at that link if you would like to know more about that. And also the next session, because we have six of these. So next week Thursday, please join us again when we look um, at regulations and also looking at how we can also safeguard uh, the commons and also the planetary life support systems. So we will be sending you communication on this again. We also do have a lineup of interesting um, speakers as well who will be sharing their knowledge with us. Thank you so much. I see everyone to Ben, to um, Ajanta in India, to everyone that has joined us, please. Thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you again. Engosi Kakumu.